the metaphysical in Henri Bergson. Today I want to talk a bit about the role of metaphysics in Bergson's thought. And of course, Bergson wrote a famous article in 1903 called An Introduction to Metaphysics. And I've done a number of videos on an introduction to metaphysics. And I'm not going to focus on an introduction to metaphysics today, but I'm going to talk about the metaphysical in Bergson more generally or as a whole, not specifically drawing on that work. So anyway, metaphysics is typically understood as the use of reason or thought in order to understand things like God, the soul, the cosmos as a whole, things that we can't directly point to and observe, which we would study by science or physics. So God, soul, cosmos, and really the second and third are what Bergson is most touching on. Um, you know, he, he concerns himself with the existence of God only tangentially and in the two sources of morality and religion, his last book. Otherwise, it's very rare that the topic of God or anything theological comes up directly in his works. So the cosmos as a whole, well, he deals with the cosmos as a whole most directly, first of all, in matter and memory. In matter and memory, he wants to look at the whole cosmos through our immediate experience as a plane of movement where our body is the center of this movement and is what organizes all of the uh, movements and what he would call images as a whole and with respect to you know a living being's way of perceiving and fitting into the world. So the whole cosmos, first of all, appears to us through our contingent factors of our life, our perceptual apparatus of our body, our habits, our history, our culture. All of that shapes the image of the universe that we perceive. And of course, we perceive clearly and vividly only a small corner of the cosmos. But through this experience, we have an immediate relation to the entire cosmos as a plane of movement. Bergson has, of course, been likened to Heraclitus many times for looking at the whole of the cosmos as movement, as being flux, a continuous flux. But Bergson has this idea that in the plane of movement, there are directions, we could say, that the movement goes in. Um, and I don't mean spatial directions, but I mean more metaphysical directions, orientations, or perspectives. The two directions are, for the entire, for the whole universe, entropy on the one hand, and evolution, creative evolution on the other hand. And this also points, according to Bergson, to a epistemological separation or divergence between integral and derivative knowledge. We often see in history that metaphysics is not seen as only some higher knowledge, but knowledge that requires a higher faculty of understanding. From Plato and Aristotle up to Descartes, Leibniz, and Spinoza even. Integral knowledge includes an infinity of details and the complete complexity of lived duration just as we immediately experience it. Derivative knowledge is like the map with respect to the terrain. Metaphysics cannot immediately hand us its truths because we are habituated to derivative knowledge. Metaphysics does not come about by merely accumulating more knowledge, but by putting out of play certain ways of thinking and approaching reality anew. Metaphysics looks at holes. The whole. This is one of the most important questions of metaphysics for Bergson. The whole of the cosmos, but we can also speak of the whole of the past, or the whole of life, or the whole of perception. And in each of these cases, when we 
use a introspective phenomenological observation of our inner life, we can find when we investigate the nature of these holes, we can find out a great deal about reality. The whole of the past is one of the most important aspects of Bergson's matter and memory. By looking at the past as a whole, or what he often calls the integral past, he finds a critique of consciousness and of the conscious state and of psychic reality as such. It's a critique of presence and presence to consciousness. So the integral knowledge of the past as a whole is neither reducible to nor conceivable through presence to consciousness. The same thing applies to the whole of life or the integral vision of life in its thrust, as he says in the introduction to creative evolution. Life is movement, growth, development, creation. It no doubt also involves divergent directions, like entropy. Life involves decay and disintegration. The whole of life, just like the whole past, is not only an infinite set. It is an infinite set that is organized in an infinity of different ways. Each moment of our psychic life touches the whole of the past, and it has a unique, singular way of relating to the past. Every conscious gathering of thoughts and images is a unique perspective formed on the past, bringing it together in a unique way. The way that we meaningfully bring forth a world, the way that we experience our being in the world, is mediated by habit, by our imitation, by our development over time of experiences and character and everything that we have accumulated through the duration of our life. So again, our ability to do metaphysics is dependent on our habituation, our rehabituation, but also the study of habit itself has certain metaphysical implications. When we study habit, we can derive certain metaphysical implications from those realities once we stop viewing them through derivative knowledge and begin viewing them as wholes. And then certain categories of being become important here that we do not consider within derivative knowledge, but within metaphysics, we must think in terms of virtuality, tension, what is latent, nascent, what is super sensible or invisible, not immediately apprehended by the senses. A habit exists even when it is not being used, it is latent or nascent. Likewise, something in the past that we want to remember but can't exactly remember, and you know, if we're attempting to remember it, we must have some proximity to its being, to its reality, such that we search for it. So we could consider it something existing that isn't entirely present to consciousness, we could say that it has a virtual or latent or nascent existence. Now, Kant wanted to replace metaphysics with the synthetic and analytic studies of consciousness, what he called transcendental philosophy. Bergson's metaphysics, not unlike Husserl's phenomenology, is the beginning of a new type of transcendental philosophy, and therefore can be called post-Kantian, since it both retrieves something from Kant and also surpasses many other things within Kant. Bergson shows that the categories of coherence are not of a static, geometrical, or symbolic character, that the a priori structures of consciousness are that of time and memory. These are the dynamic forms of experience, and the hylaic data is itself vibrant, rhythmic, and qualitatively rich for Bergson, unlike for Kant. So Bergson's phenomenology, if we want to call it that, and by that I mean his attempt to form inner subjective knowledge of the essences of our experience of Duray, as well as of memory, of invention, grace, and movement more general. 
the phenomenology of movement elicits the core question of metaphysics. It is the contestation of the reality of movement itself by logic. The evidence of our derivation and the half-truth of our intellectual generalization or homogenization shows us the mind structuring reality using a set of concepts fully suited to practical life and to science. That is at least to mechanical sciences as they were emerging in Bergson's time. Bergson liked to say that metaphysics started with Zeno when the limits of derivative analytical knowledge manifest in the absurdity that movement is impossible and unreal. What it in fact proves, if we look deeper, is that our mind uses the faculties it has derived from practical life to understand reality and fails to understand reality precisely because of the tools used in the process. That is, above all, geometrical diagramming in space, which is the archetype of derivative knowledge. Again, metaphysics has to do with the invisible, the supersensible, what is virtual, latent, nascent, everything that is irreducible to the present or to a representation or a concept, and ultimately what evades symbols and words. Think, for example, about a skill. A skill is nowhere. It can be seen when it's in action, and in that case, it's everywhere in the action, but in no particular single moment of the action. So the skill is nowhere but everywhere in the act of doing it. The skill as a whole is irreducible to any particular instantiation of it. You know, a great musician, you could see them perform, and while this shows the musician, and we encounter them in their concrete complexity, something still we might say that's still infinite, but this is not a representation of the totality of that musician's skill as a whole, which changes over time and meanders and while it has a certain style, that style is incredibly difficult to describe and is unique to the sensations and types of movement and patterns of movement associated with that individual within their concrete history. To understand the style of a writer, we need to not only follow all of their movements, but move variously between a number of ways of schematizing the whole of all of their movements from unique perspectives. Ultimately, their style is an assemblage of fragmentary personas that loosely fit together and contrast. So the style as a whole is never present to consciousness, but we attune to it and are directed through it. What is movement and how could our minds grasp it? Movement is stepping out of itself at the same time it's stepping into something new. It always has this double sense of departing and arriving. It is always beyond itself, leaving itself behind in order to become, to alter, to develop, to deteriorate. The dynamic order is ordered by the durational transcendental structuring understood as degrees of tension and contraction in the vito-mechanical order of embodied life that habituates our attention to life but also that brings forth a life world for us. Edmund Husserl called this the natural attitude. It's the sort of average, everyday way of interacting with the world. And while this helps us think about interworldly beings in a helpful way, it helps us get around in the world, our absorption in this, our absorption in the world and in the things that we care for within the world keeps us from studying the activity of consciousness and putting all of that meaning together. We never notice that there is a noema, as Husserl calls it. And the noema is perhaps one of the more metaphysical aspects of consciousness. The noema is the ideal object of consciousness. It's, you could think, the perfect idea that consciousness could have. And instead of this idea being present to consciousness or having representation or representational content to it, it is known implicitly 
as a sort of assumption that brings forth the world, which by having this idea, we strive for a world to be brought forth. Merleau-Ponty showed precisely how this worked within the lived body, that sensory motor habits must be formed in order for us to perceive and make sense of the world. Now, again, consciousness is an attunement and a adjusting and restructuring of memory in conjunction with the present becoming. It's not just a gathering and merging of images, a sort of reproductive imagination, as they would classically be called, nor is it merely the sum of semantic and syntactical information formed linguistically. No, when we are attuned in a certain way, with a certain unique way of contracting our memories, we create a unique, infinite, integral unity of that multiplicity. And we could call this a monad, and I think that Bergson has Leibniz in mind throughout matter and memory and throughout his early career. Leibniz helps us a lot here when we think about this idea of taking a pencil and randomly marking dots on a piece of paper. So we take this piece of paper with, you know, let's say 100 randomly poked dots on it, and we can come up with a function of a line that the paper touches every single one of them. You know, and we can think of individual people, monads, in that sense, as having an infinite number of unique concrete details. And again, we can think of these as the dots. Um, they are implicitly enfolded in our monadic being. Um, and they can be arranged in an infinite number of ways, these shining points, as Bergson calls them. Uh, each way of rearranging it is something unique and connects it in a certain way and unlocks certain functions, we could say. Each plane of organization of our entire past relates the multiplicity, not only with memories, but also with our habits, our skills, our passions, as well as our traumas, our injury, our vices, and our illness. Every degree of tension of vital energy is a unique, sui generis leap, as is seen in evolution. And philosophy calls us to invent not only new rearrangements of the material world, but also of new attunements, new noema, new directions of movement, new ways of interpreting, new ways of being in the world, new ways of bringing forth the world. This is called a modulation, according to Merleau-Ponty. It is a shift in our reference frame. It's a shift in the way that we make sense of a scene. Phenomenology uncovers the modulation, right? It discovers that modulation is occurring within consciousness, that we're attuned in the phenomenological attitude at one moment, that we're attuned practically, that in another moment we are detached from these modes of attunement in listening to music or perhaps in doing philosophy and metaphysics. So while phenomenology uncovers the modulation by studying consciousness, metaphysics unpacks certain implications from modulation. This will, of course, be the discovery of a whole entire immense and complex aspect of our consciousness, even our daily consciousness, that we never notice, that we never pay attention to, because it is what directs our attention as such, right? We modulate our attention to something, and we're paying attention to that thing. We're not paying attention to the fact that we started paying attention to it. So philosophers must be inventors, and invention 
creates something new, a new way of organizing things, but more importantly, it creates a new plane of consciousness, a new way of contracting experience as a whole. Every repetition of anything within our experience, within our life, involves something new and unique. The infinite here is closely related to irreversibility, the fact that every moment of time is in an irreversible series with everyone. Other moment means that there are an infinite number of unique moments in time, irreplaceable by any other moment. So this multiplicity is unlike any other multiplicity, is unlike number itself. Mathematical number is a quantity of indiscriminate units put together in a set without any concern for the sameness or difference between what is counted within the set. Concrete number, or concrete multiplicity, as we should probably call it, is the singular event numbering of an infinite number of moments, which nevertheless grows at every moment and never repeats, has no repeated or totalized quantity. This multiplicity does not form a totality. The infinite, as we experience it in our memory, is not only endlessly growing infinity, burgeoning always into novelty as becoming, it also is a flux and dilation of the whole on the periphery of consciousness, a change of reference, a modulation, where we find a new function of the line that not only touches the singularity of the dots, but which strings them together in a more graceful or elegant way. Consciousness is not presence, but is what brings forth presence by attuning into the frequency of the images themselves. We tune into their resonance, and only then do we find their qualitative complexity and subtlety. Whenever we learn something new, we have to tune in to the unique character of the experience, and this requires a sui generis, unique degree of tension in our consciousness that is accompanying the thinking and understanding, which puts together new thoughts and puts together the thoughts in a new way. The noema of consciousness in general is the intention to mean something, to feel something. Maybe it is to survey and to estimate and to take precautions. It is a intention to make coherence come forth. What is the noema of remorse? Remorse is this emotion where the object we are feeling is this broken and unwell consciousness. We are self-conscious of our unwellness. It is an agony of remorse. And of course, this emotion is related to irreversibility. The offense or something done is irreversible. There's a scar. There is an unerasable trace, a sort of moral implication arises from our encounter with remorse, with this feeling of remorse, the agony of the irreversibility of time. We can unravel a metaphysical implication of irreversibility just as we derive moral implication. According to Vladimir Jankelevich, remorse is what you could call the tragic form of intuition. It is an intuitive knowledge of the reality of the past, the irreversibility of the past, as well as of our inner life, our attunement to the world. And it is a sick, sad, suffering consciousness which throws into question the power and worthiness of our consciousness. The noema motivates and augments or contracts the pathing of the line that we trace through our singularities. 
but it also is changing transformationally over duration. We can incorporate a multitude of such functions, such mappings, you know, multiple planes of consciousness, um, and their corresponding multiplicities um, that they trace together, we can hold not as an idea present to consciousness, but as a multiplicity of perspectives on a reality that cannot be reduced to one perspective. And every moment of reality, even if we only look at a finite part of it, has a trace of the integral reality that it is a fragment of. Um, there are fragmentary monads, we could say, a perspective on the whole that vastly exceeds our comprehension, that exceeds comprehension, that exceeds all architectonic conceptualization. The phenomenology of movement, as well as the phenomenology of effort and attention of consciousness, depend on our attempt to make sense of our existence memory of all psychic functions, of all modes of sense-making, is really the most extreme case of a possible experience of our consciousness. Memory is a concrete condition of all consciousness, of all actual consciousness. Experience that is never present in totality is a condition of our experience. Something that we never fully experience is the condition of our experience. It only comes into presence when we open up to our memories in a certain way when or when we perceive their traces and we are reminded of them. Every time we remember, we are open to reassessing the way we connect the dots to some degree, uh, both in terms of gradual decay of the memory, becoming more general, fading, or you know, putting the pieces together in the right way drawing more out of the memories than what we had when we thought them, you know, learning from them, deriving experience and wisdom from them. Tuning into movement is a way of reconnecting the dots. So this phenomenology of movement teaches us about the modulation, the attunement that goes on when we tune to the inner sense and direction of movement. Now, movement isn't everything, and ableism can you know, reinscribe movement into a system of identity and oppression. But immobility is just as profound and important a aspect of reality. So, you know, process, philosophy, these kinds of things, we love movement, but movement isn't everything. Immobility is also as profound and important. You know, immov immovability, like irrevocability, is this undisplaceable, unerasable fact of past being. So it has this connection to time and the ontology of the past. Happenings that no longer can happen. They can no longer change. They lost the potency to become, but have gained in another kind of immobile longevity, a being of perpetuity, the past haunts the present, it is unerasable, it shadows over the present, it even determines in some sense the horizons of the future to some extent, it conditions them, it gives them a certain appetition and repulsion. Without this, life becomes a hopeless endeavor. Without some appetition, without some perpetuity of ends, something that endures as a desirable goal, something that persists in time, drawing us towards it, motivating us and giving us purpose for our actions and our movements and our thinking. If life is to remain bearable, one must maintain a certain balance between suffering, grief, disintegration, and the growth, healing, you know, the hierarchy of needs that lead to higher vocations. What is the philosopher's vocation? What is the calling to which metaphysics is the answer? Kant, I think, saw that the vocation of the prior metaphysics that he wanted to dismiss was not wholly different from the vocation of his critical method of transcendental philosophy. 
that really the, the vocation of metaphysics, of classical metaphysics, even though it needed to be completely revised, it was the same sort of vocation being answered. The human spirit is called to do metaphysics, is called to philosophy. But how do we answer that call? How do we approach that? Well, Kant says we first have to know epistemology. We have to know the structure of our mind. We have to know the structure of how we think and understand things. The problem of all metaphysics is that it misuses the tools that our mind has at its, at its disposal. So Kant thinks that there was an urge which led to naive metaphysics, and it was to find its true satisfaction in transcendental categories and the ideals of consciousness that it gives to itself in understanding itself in transcendental philosophy. Their objectivity, which is of course the prize of Kant's critique to be won, is handed down from a a priori, an atemporal consciousness that exists prior to and outside of time and to which all thinking conforms. The metaphysical vocation is the concern for not only existence as a whole, but for the act of concern itself as an experience and as a being who is called to attend to these implicit patterns, these hidden harmonies, these super sensible realities of experience. You know, we are an ensemble of mental processes, images, thoughts, directing their way through life with a limited understanding of all that makes life possible. And we draw more out of less by habituation and through our creativity and intelligence. You know, imitation in early life gives way to a, an array of micro judgments that accumulate in our understanding of the world. Our unique aspirations and values guide the string of contingencies that leads to the successes and failures of our life. It is what ultimately makes the line connecting the infinity of points trace the exact path that it traces. Bergsonian metaphysics remains embedded in concrete life, in history, in the contingent facts of our world. But from them, it unpacks a set of intuitions, of insights, of transformational ideas, things that once we've thought them, we irreversibly change the way that we think and understand. The way that we think about our place in the cosmos, the way that we approach that question is embedded within these experiential, experimental, we could say, transcendental empiricism, or we could say transcendental phenomenology, or these phenomenological investigations, whatever we want to call it. And I'm not saying these are identical, but they're a shared vocation. This will lead us to a certain understanding of some classical metaphysical questions like the reality of the soul, its existence after death, and our place in the cosmos, our relation to creation and evolution and emergence. No doubt Bergson thought that if anyone were to seriously, deeply consider what he has considered to follow him in his descriptions and in his analyses, that for them, the question of the existence of the soul after death will be one of probability rather than unknown. Its existence will not be a belief, and we are not forced to a position of agnosticism. One will find that the psychic state far exceeds presence to consciousness, and as far as we know, the brain is needed only for the experience of presence to consciousness. And just as the past exists independently of the present, the present isn't what makes the past be what the past was. And just as a skill of behavior or a pattern of movement exists even when it's not being actualized, so the soul is independent in its past virtual existence and endures despite the changes in the present. Because the soul exists in the past, it evades the investigations of science and dissections of the body. Because it is not reducible to the present or presence to consciousness, it, it, it evades 
the analysis of logic and representational conceptual thinking more generally is always incumbent, Bergson says, on the philosophers of freedom and of consciousness to provide an explanation where the opponents have no need to provide arguments because the tools by which they seek to answer these questions hand us over agnosticism at best and rejection and reductionism in the most cases. Bergson's metaphysical psychology draws evidence from every possible area of our experience. For example, in the life of dreams, we are in this more detached state. Our concerns of life are distant, more distant from us. Our consciousness begins to dilate sp sporadically, um, you know, in response to its own imaginations and narratings and creating of dreams. The incursion of the past on the present happens in a somewhat unorchestrated way, um, you know, not orchestrated by the needs of our concrete situation. We have, you know, occasionally very specific dreams, and um, from time to time, they are just directly, you know, representative of something in our waking life. But on, by and large, dreams have a fluid, you know, redirecting power. They have these disconnected episodes um, to them. That's the norm, and that's because we are in this dilated state where a new image can be, uh, you know, lead to another image that is barely related to it, and all of a sudden we're off on another path within the dream. And, you know, with every mounting piece of evidence of our consciousness being a sort of Hermes moving back and forth between the realm of the past and of the present, um, the more we see consciousness doing that, the more we understand its metaphysical implications, the more we reveal and unpack aspects of reality that cannot be explained in terms of presence, science, reductionism, and presence to consciousness, etc. Nowadays, people talk a lot about attachment. What are the metaphysical implications of attachment? That's the question that I've come back to again and again in this and that Bergson insisted on throughout his philosophical career. And you know, in a way goes back to Plato, Aristotle, and especially Ravesson's reading of them. We find that consciousness is involved in our understanding of reality and with it, life as a whole. So our attachment and our patterns of attachment, what does that indicate to us? Well, it indicates that there is another aspect of reality irreducible to the present tendencies, habits, and all of that, and that it roots our understanding of consciousness within life. But what happens in life and in the life of the metaphysician is that the mind draws more from itself than it contains. And with these phenomena of attachment and of dreams and all of this evidence from phenomenology, we draw more out of them. We draw out metaphysical implications, and we draw even out of these metaphysical implications a way of transforming our being. It changes our way of being. That's the implication of the metaphysical implications, our way of thinking, and above all, we reorient our vocation. We find a new vocation. We follow a new calling. We modify the vocation that was in Kant or that was prior to Kant or that goes back to our ancient, ancient prehistoric ancestors. You know, the power of thought to either distort or reveal reality, this pluripotentiality of thought, you know, coming to see that that, you know, reality is understood through our thinking and that the source and meaning of all thought and thinking uh, is where we find our philosophical vocation. It is by encountering our power of thinking, our ability to distort or reveal reality, that we find a calling to do philosophy. 
by learning, you know, firsthand of our natural powers. We learn what we can do. And from that, we find our calling and we find a calling that we can answer because we see within ourselves this potential. Our natural power is as much an ability as it is an impediment to philosophy. The mind is led by its natural powers to false metaphysical problems. This is Kant's idea. We even find this in Aristotle and transformed by Bergson. Only by an inner transformation arising from the study of the mind by the mind can it do what the mind does. It draws more out of itself than it contains. It reinvents itself. It creates a new power within itself. It transforms and evolves itself. So the metaphysical for Bergson, above all, is this power to create. And, you know, he says famously that time is creation or it's nothing. And so we can see this kind of like circular structure of reference. I'm not saying it's logically circular, but it's at least referentially circular that the mind, creation, time, duration, all of these things loop together and are the central kernel of the metaphysical. And by studying them, we transform ourselves, we unpack from them certain implications, they reorient the way that we think.